a good way to grow our economy post depression and post war uh, to essentially get with the program and all get on the same page and because this approach has some short-term benefits but some long-term liabilities we, we all basically find ourselves in the long term together and are all kind of struggling in, in many of the same ways yeah that totally makes sense is there any regions or areas where you're seeing people are recognizing this more than other areas or places that you see as as generally struggling with this sort of concept of what makes a strong town in, in uh, the organization's opinion it's a it's a it's a it's a good question and it's a tough one I, I think different places have different advantages and different ranges in terms of of what they see and how they're dealing with things um, you go to the Northeast and the Northeast uh, their cities were pretty well built and established before we started ripping cities apart after World War two and so you have a lot of intact kind of urban fabric that itself is very strong and resilient they tend to have a different culture there and I, I think some of their problems maybe are going to struggle in that direction you go to a place like Texas and I think Texas is uh, very happy to have a conversation about how we do the math at the government level how we make uh, the government essentially prudent and, and fiscally responsible at the local level yet they're so married to a post World War II development pattern based around spreading things out they have a lot of space in Texas uh, connecting everything with very expensive roads they sometimes have a little bit of myopia when it comes to that so we all struggle a little bit in in slightly different ways and a lot of it has to do with where our starting point was generally the further east you are the more established your core community was and the more essentially like building blocks e easy stuff you have to start with the further west you go the more post-war it is and kind of the harder it is to retrofit and I, I think in some ways that makes the conversation um, a little bit harder because it's a it's a it's it's a it's a radical shift to uh, to, to to change you know the layout of ninety percent of your city. Yeah, that's a that's a huge thing to uh, to absolutely do. And so you've talked a lot, Chuck, about a uh, Ponzi scheme that is city growth and those kinds of things. Why? Why should people who are watching this, who are primarily mayors and elected officials from all over the country, why should they care about that concept? I think there's a couple. I mean, I, I, I run into elected officials all day, and they, especially at the local level, they care. Um, so I think the question, you know, why, why is this important? Why should we be aware of it? There's a natural human tendency to value positive feedback today and to deeply discount negative uh, feedback in the future. It, 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 psychologists call this temporal discounting. Um, it's the reason why people smoke. It's the reason why you'll watch TV instead of go to the gym. You know, we don't anticipate lung cancer. We don't anticipate heart disease. We know it's out there. We, we're aware of it. We're smart people, but we discount it and we value the, the positive feedback today. So when cities do projects, uh, we know that there's long-term maintenance. We know that someday we're going to have to come back and, and maintain that pipe and fix that road. But but we can tell ourselves, you know, the people in the future are going to be a, a lot. They're going to be a, a lot better off. We're we're investing in growth for them. You know, when we get out there, they're going to have more money. Fixing this thing is not going to be a big deal today, though. We really have to do it because we're we're we need the growth. We're kind of desperate. Uh, we need this project to happen. Those people in the future, they'll figure this out. The problem is we live in the, the future of people in the past who made these decisions. And what we see at the local level is that cities have lots and lots of backlog of maintenance. Uh, they have a lot of unfunded maintenance liabilities. At the federal level, we're talking about dropping a trillion dollars on infrastructure. And we all at the local level understand that when you aggregate it up, that that is a – I mean, that – that's a drop in the bucket. It, it's it's literally half of what the California local budget backlog is. Just just California. So mm -hmm. I mean, go to go to 50 states, and, and we have an enormous backlog of maintenance at the local level. So the Ponzi scheme aspect is the idea that we can get growth today. That growth gives us transaction fees. If a developer can pay for it, if the state can help subsidize it. 
if we can borrow some money to make it work. Uh, that helps us out our budget today, but in exchange we take on these enormous long-term promises that we'll fix this stuff, we'll maintain this stuff, we'll go back and, and service these areas. And when you add those up, when you actually do the math and balance that out, we're taking on way more liabilities than our tax base will support. And so once we're aware of that and that kind of seductive trap to, to, that we keep falling into, uh, we can start to make different choices about where we invest and, and, and what promises we make for the long term. Uh-oh, did you mute yourself, my friend? Because I'm, I'm not catching you right now. <laughs> for some reason, you're not coming through on my audio anymore, pal. No. Oh, now I got oh. you back. Yeah, I don't know what hey. I don't know I don't know what you clicked on there, but that worked. I didn't click anything. I was keeping my hands off this time. Huh. Uh, so it must have just been a uh, connection issue. So all of a sudden you just came back in and you're perfect. Good. Go on. Well, I'm there sorry. we go. Oh. Uh, no. What I was gonna say was uh, that uh, I think I lost my train of thought there for a little bit. Um, by with close the strong concept is there a difference that you see like right now politically we are seeing a significant difference between larger cities and rural areas and different parts like Minnesota where we are um, it's day and night difference a lot of times uh, between rural areas and I grew up in a rural area um, and is there a difference between urban and suburban and rural areas for accepting and working with the strong town message you not see much a difference and everybody kind of works the same way no it is a there's a big difference and it's because the models are, are very very different um, if we just look at uh, urban suburban where there's this there's this inner relationship just geographically uh, there's a sense that small towns and rural areas are basically a small version of the urban rural uh, I'm sorry, the urban suburban system. So when we look at a city like Brainerd, uh, we think of Brainerd and then the surrounding area as being like just a small version of Minneapolis, St. Paul and the surrounding suburbs. And so we've tended to apply uh, from the state level, from the federal level, very similar policies uh, to these places when in fact the economies are fundamentally different and everything about them is, is very, very different. I'll, I'll give you just one like obvious example. Uh, if you're the city planner in the city of Brainerd and you lose your job, where do you go? There, there's no like equivalent job anywhere around here. Um, if you are the city planner in the city of Minneapolis, not only you're working in a huge staff, uh, but if you were to lose your job for some reason, uh, there's lots of planning jobs in the metro area. You can you can find a job somewhere. So what it does is it it changes the nature of how government works, and it changes the relationship between uh, government and people. In, in ways that are fundamentally different. You you have, uh, just in that example with the planner, you have a very risk-averse kind of staff approach um, just because, you you know, you can't get fired. There's no other job around here. Uh, so it, it, it changes the approach quite a bit. I think also uh, a lot of the things that we see working in metro areas, uh, in, 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 you know, a big city and the surrounding suburbs, when we try to take those to small towns, uh, what we what we wind up with are things that are out of scale. Uh, I, I pointed out here like a, a 14 million dollar project which we just finished in my hometown is one and a half year of the total budget. If you were to do that in a city like Minneapolis St. Paul you would be talking about you know a, a 1.5 billion dollar you'd be talking about three brand new sports stadiums you know every every other year. Uh, those things are right. just way out of scale. So what we what we've done is we've scaled small towns wrong, and because of that, the conversation in small towns tends to be a lot different. I, I, I've I've pointed it out like this, and I I think, again, not to get political, uh, but I think this is an important reference point. Um, if you're in a small town or a rural area, state and federal government are the like decision makers. I mean, they're 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 the people that are driving the agenda. The big project. I look back here over the last 10 years, uh, we've had five successive big projects and they're all funded by 
state and federal money. And they've all been huge and transformative in ways that I, I, I don't think are positive. If you go to a, a large city, uh, the federal and state government might provide a little match. They might be, uh, you know, a little bit of help here and there in getting something difficult done. But most of the stuff you're funding yourself locally. Most of the money is coming from you. And so I, I think it creates a different relationship with the state and federal programs. In, in an urban, suburban setting, they're partners. And in the small town setting, they're kingmakers. And I, I do think that that has an impact on how, you know, at a local level, we view government. Do you think there's a way that that, uh, is there a mechanism out there today that sh rural and smaller cities should be able to, uh, to handle themselves and to not be reliant upon state and federal government for things? I, I think, again, it gets back a little bit to scale. Uh, I, I, I hesitate. I've, I've used the word reliant, and I, I don't think that's a bad way to think of it, although uh, it, we can look back historically, and small towns and rural areas have always been reliant on, on cities for their survival, and, and vice versa. There is an there is a interplay back and forth because uh, cities can't produce food. They're not going to get mining. They're not going to have logging. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in rural areas that cities need. So there's always been a flow, in a sense, of capital from urban areas to rural areas. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think what we've done you know, post-World War II is we've scaled small towns and rural areas in a way that not only can they not uh, take care of it themselves, it's not even close. Um, we have 853 cities in Minnesota. Uh, you know, almost all of really? them... Yeah, something like that. Almost all of them hmm. below 10,000 people. And of those below 10,000 people, I, I, can't, I can't point to one that financially has any mechanism to maintain its own infrastructure, not even, not even close. Not even, in some cases, you know, 20 cents on the dollar. So we have this, like, built-up crisis in small towns uh, where, you know, the, the basic systems, the sewer pipe, the water system... Uh, you're wholly dependent on uh, these larger government programs to take care of that stuff, and there's no way, there's no way that can happen. So we built this mastermind session, Chuck, on basically on the concept of your town is not strong enough to, to survive in the next ten years. Do you think that's something that uh, is is possible for some communities? Do you think that that is something that is uh, that people are positioning themselves to be successful in the long term, or where do you think that that is? Because we've got a lot of a lot of folks here with us today who uh, would dramatically disagree with that. Some would agree with that, but where? What do you think? Well, it's interesting because I, I was in Northern California um, last year, and uh, the 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 conversation in Northern California was. Hey, we're growing. Things are great. We got our budget under control. Uh, times are good. And I said, um, you know, uh, 2008, and, and more specifically for city governments, because there was a, a little bit of a delay in terms of tax receipts and stuff. Uh, 2010. I said 2010 wasn't that long ago. Could you could you do that again? They said, Oh my gosh, that was a disaster. <laughs> we were we were uh, we didn't know how we were going to make it through. Like things were so bad. Things were so tight. And the funny thing is, is that uh, 2010 included, a, a, you know, a, a massive amount of subsidy for local governments. I, I know, in retrospect, maybe we don't appreciate that, uh, but you know, the stimulus bill that was passed in 2009, uh, some of the uh, shovel-ready project stuff, all this was designed basically to prop up local governments, you know, be they state government or federal government, so that we didn't have. Uh, what in a Keynesian sense is this like massive government pullback in a, a time of need. So as bad as we thought it was, uh, it, it, it could have been way, way, way worse. I think when we step back today and we look at cities um, and how fragile they are financially, uh, you know, cities have massive uh, backlog of deferred maintenance, uh, we, I mean, ignore the pension crisis because I, I think that's a, a separate thing that I'm not an expert in, but it kind of looms there over everything. Um, but just right. in terms of like the infrastructure and the promises we've made there, 
uh, in addition to the debt that we've taken on, it, it doesn't leave much margin for error. It doesn't take a lot of a, a number of bad years in a row to make things go really bad. I'll just give my uh, city as an example. Uh, one third of our budget is aid from the state. Um, one third of our budget is money we get from the state. Uh, uh, we have 35% uh, of our budget, um, so roughly a third, uh, is debt service. Um, money we're paying on debt. Uh, if we lose that money from the state, which actually was you know, put on the table back in the last crisis, I mean, you look at the state's budget and when they're running a huge deficit, are they going to cut education? Are they going to cut, uh, you know, public safety? What are they going to cut? The easiest cut for them to make is local government aid, um, especially when, you know, the, 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 the towns that need it the most are generally the ones that are, you know, the most uh, cut happy, right? Um, right. So, so, you know, what happens when my when the state cuts local government aid? We're, we're literally in a situation where uh, 60 per, six out of every $10 we bring in would have to go to debt service. That leaves no money for staff. That leaves no money for road maintenance. No money for police and fire protection. It, that's a devastating situation, and and that doesn't even account for the backlog and all the other commitments we've made that are coming due. So it's a very fragile situation, and all our cities are are in this kind of counting on everybody else coming to their rescue in a way that's just not not feasible. So in Brainerd, is it is it fair, however, to criticize the city for having a third of their budget being LGA because a lot of that money was raised in their community to start with. So like in Minnesota, the cities don't get a choice as to, and I know it's this way in a lot of different communities across the country, that the state sucks up all the money that they raise and then they dole it back out as they so please. And so a lot of that money that comes back in local government aid in the state is money that was raised through sales tax and other taxes in their community already. So how, how do we criticize them for that when it's money that if the state hadn't gotten into it, then they would be able to keep and have raised and be stronger on their own? Yeah, I, I, I completely hear you. And I would not, you know, I think criticize is maybe the wrong word. I, I think maybe we have to have an understanding. We we go back to, again, uh, you know, right after the World War II, and we look at the explosive growth that we had, uh, and we got to a point in the late 60s, early 70s, all over the country, where it, it seemed like the I'll use the I'll use the modern term progressive. I don't think that was what they called it, but the the compassionate, the kind thing to do, the the right thing to do, because we were such an affluent country. We had so much wealth, we had so much money, we had we had, had so much prosperity, particularly compared to the rest of the world, which was still recovering from the devastation of the war. Uh, that it it seemed like a really smart thing to do, to basically centralize the funding and the collection of taxes, and then ensure we can use the word equity or whatever, ensure that every city had a, a fire department, every city had a police department, every city had clean water and good sewage. I get this. I mean, when you are a, a wealthy, affluent country, wh why should people drink tainted water? Why should there be sewage in the streets? So what you see happening around the country in the late 60s and early 70s was something uh, essentially sold to business people on an efficiency standpoint and sold to uh, you know uh, others on a compassion and equity standpoint that we would get rid of all these local taxes you couldn't have your own local fees anymore you couldn't have your own local sales tax or property tax you couldn't really configure your thing in a different way we were gonna make that efficient across the whole state the state would collect the taxes and the state would give the money back this worked really well for quite a while um, it, you know it, it if you think about it, if you're Walmart, if you're McDonald's, do you want to go to a state where you've got to negotiate a separate tax structure in every single city? They've got their own little fiefdoms and their own... No, you want to one state rule that you can just apply and go and the state will collect the money and you can just build, 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 build. So this created this huge boom. The problem is now, as things have gone on, we see the state becoming more and more insolvent. The state has all these deferred promises that they have to make now. Um, 
And so uh, they're kind of, in a sense, reneging on that process. They're, they're going back and saying, yeah, we know we promised that we'll collect the money and then dole it back to you, but hey, that's not working out well for us anymore. And you see the, the conversation kind of creeping in, and this has been you know, my entire professional life, where it's like, you know, why does the state take care of these cities? Why can't these cities take care of themselves? Why aren't they doing this? And so what we've tried to tell cities is I, I, I get – I understand how we got here with the best of intentions, um, but right now uh, you've got an unfaithful partner. I mean, you, you, you know, you, you may have gotten married uh, with you know rose-colored glasses about the future, but your partner is unfaithful to you now, and they they have no incentive to be faithful. Uh, the state and the federal governments are not going to come to your rescue. Go ask Detroit how that's working out. Right. Um, and you have zero opportunity to get a divorce as well. You, amen. You're, you're stuck in this abusive spouse relationship, right? You, you can't get a divorce. So all you can do is start taking care of yourself. And I think once we, you know, once we shift our focus from, uh, you know, these people are essentially our caretakers or, you know, we're, we're a, a, a spouse that we're in a partnership with, and instead realize that this is this is a separate entity with their own incentives and their own objectives, and those in a sense sometimes match up with ours, and that's great. But a lot of times collide with ours. Uh, that we need to put our local financial resiliency a a ahead of uh, you know the incentives and the other programs that are that are being doled out, and we we need to think long term about our places. Because I mean, you can look at Detroit and you can see. At the end of the day, it's Detroit, their city council, their mayor, their staff, and they got to make do. And nobody's coming to help them. Nobody's nobody's right. bailed. Nobody's rescuing them. Especially the state of Michigan. Uh, yeah. Like, that stuff that, is crazy. Is going on in Michigan. It is, but it but also, I mean, in defense of the state of Michigan, state of Michigan is a disaster too. And uh, you know. Are they going to go bail out their biggest city? Are they going to go bail out Flint? Are they going to go bail? Out? I mean, where where do the where where does it end? There 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 isn't enough Michigan to make good on all the promises that local government has made, and that's uh you know that's 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 not a happy reality, um, but it is, and it just means that we at the local level actually have to start becoming prudent and responsible again. I, let me right. just add to. Um, I actually feel like the way this thing ultimately works itself out is that cities are going to be given the response, you know, very clearly the responsibility to solve these problems. They also need to be given the tools. So all those things we undid in the late 60s and early 70s, can't have your local tax structure, can't, uh, you know, you, you can only raise taxes a certain amount a year, you can only charge fees for certain things. All those rules need to go away. And cities need to be able to do things differently uh, on their own, because really, Shakopee is a very different economy than Brainerd. It's a very different mm -hmm. economy than Minnesota's Iron Range. It's a very different economy than the ag parts out in the western side of the state. It's a very different economy than Minneapolis-St. Paul. Why do these cities that are so different have the same exact tax structure? It doesn't make any sense. None. Land. It, it doesn't. So, so we have a sales tax that's a modest part, and then we have this property tax. The relationship between property and sales is way different in Minneapolis-St. Paul than it is in a tourist area, than it is in a mining area, than it is in an ag area. Why do we have that same tax structure forced upon all these local governments? That that's as part of this, uh, you know, walking away and the, the the cheating spouse kind of, you know, hey, it's uh, you're on your own now. Uh, part of that's got to be we got to give cities the tools back that they need to to succeed. All right, so I got a question from Becky, and she's in Florida. And so her question for me was that uh, actually her question for you is about the about infrastructure and roads. And their her community is uh, I don't know how big it is. Maybe you can let me know, Becky. But uh, her community is having trouble keeping up on paying for that infrastructure of roads. So what are your big solutions for? that is it just <laughs> stop doing that or, or where 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 do people go with this yeah um, it's funny because I, and I'll say I, I say this in talks that I give around the country and it's it's important um, but it's not going to be helpful or affirming um, 
you ask for a solution, and I think it's important to understand that problems have solutions. Uh, predicaments have outcomes. Um, we've built ourselves into a predicament. Uh, there really is, in many ways, uh, no no chance that we're going to maintain all the all the roads that we built. We've we've built more than we can sustain, and more than the tax base that has resulted actually has the capacity to fix. So it's important to stop talking about this as a problem, seeking a solution, and start talking about this as a predicament. Uh, with outcomes that we can start to manage and deal with. Uh, we did a, a huge study uh, with a group called Urban 3 out of Asheville, North Carolina, uh, for the city of Lafayette, Louisiana. Lafayette, Louisiana is a little over 200,000 people. They have a 50 plus million dollar backlog of road maintenance. Uh, they could triple their road maintenance budget and every year they would still be adding to the backlog. So th th there's no way they're going to catch up with this huge backlog of road maintenance. They have built too many roads. And it's easy to understand how this happened. The developers would come in and, and the developers would uh, you know, say, we'll build the road, we'll pay for it. Um, it's not going to cost you, the city, anything. Uh, the developers would go out and do that. They would roll those costs over into the sale of the homes. People would buy those. They, they would pay their mortgages. And so you know, that's how the roads were initially paid for. The people then would pay their taxes. And the money of their taxes, the percent that would go to fixing roads, would go fix other roads in the city because their road was brand new. Um, you grow like that for you know, two, three, four decades. And what you find is that the more you grow, the more money you get that you can take care of the old stuff. This is the Ponzi scheme part. But the more promises you're making for the future. And because we never stopped and said, how much tax base do we need to actually take care of this road? Uh, in the future, uh, what we've found is that we built way more roads than that tax base will fix. What we told the city of Lafayette, because the city of Lafayette actually asked us at the at, after we did this study, um, you know, what 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 do we do now? And we said, well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but here's some ways to think about this. Um, I can't remember how many miles of road they had, but it was like 20 percent or 25 percent of the road miles they had were dead end cul-de-sacs. Um, if you're trying to triage a system, if you said we have we have enough money to fix one out of every three you know miles of road we've got, which is probably not a bad number. That's, that's probably a pretty accurate number actually when you look at the tax base. About one third of the roads we have the money to fix. Um, the easiest ones to walk away from, or the easiest ones to not maintain, are the dead end cul-de-sacs. Um, those are essentially like publicly maintained driveways. They have no broader public function, uh, you know, turn those back over to the people that are there and uh, allow them to maintain them themselves instead of pretending that the city is going to come in and, and do that. Here right. in Minnesota, we have road maintenance districts, and uh, I, I think in those kind of areas, I would go to them and say, hey, there's, you know, there's this maintenance district. If you'd like, we can charge you directly for the maintenance of this road. Um, but really, uh, when we triage, and what we need to look at is, is you know, what are the central places that people actually travel? And what you find is that Main Street, uh, the roads, you know, into town and out of town, uh, they become the hypercritical ones, and all these little local service drives become uh, far less important. I, I I just said that all as if that's an easy conversation to have. That is a brutally hard conversation to have. And I'm not going to pretend that it's not, but you know the option is to do what Detroit did, which is to tell people, "Hey, um, we'll maintain your road. Yeah, we'll get to it. You know, we know we got this backlog, but the the money's coming in. We're going to go borrow some money. We're working with this hedge fund to finance this stuff. And then you know one day you just wake up and the you know the last bit of fiction that that contains is gone, and you can't maintain any of." And that's really where Detroit found itself. So I, I think we have to have these in, these conversations before we get to that point. So, Chuck, we've got about 15 minutes left here, and uh, I want to get into the concept of what types of things you see happening in the communities that you're working with that are the most successful that people can emulate. What do you see happening out there today that people can really work from and utilize and, and steal Awesome. I, I, in a in a sense, I think we have to think about cities 
used to be like, I'm going to do my graphic here. It used to be like this, expanded like this, and we've got too much stuff to fix. So what do you, what do, you do in that situation? You actually have to ask the question, how do we make better use of the stuff we've already built? So instead of taking a city that's now this big and then trying to make it this big to solve your problems, what if we take a city that's this big and say, how do we go you know, in the, in, the, in the guts of that city and the blocks and the neighborhoods, how do we make better use of this stuff? And when we start asking that question, what we find is that a whole different set of strategies come to the fore, uh, strategies that are really small and fine-grained. So instead of doing the $14 million project out on the edge of town, what we find is that the $14,000 project to fix the sidewalks is, is a much better investment. The, uh, the, the little things we do to make our neighborhoods more livable uh, more walkable, give more business opportunities. So things like putting in crosswalks, uh, planting street trees, uh, getting, you know, I was out last night looking at the street lights in my neighborhood and they've got those like unhooded ones that just shine everywhere and when you get, you know, the hood on and it, you, what you're talking about here are quality of life things. How do we make our, exi uh, how do we get more investment on our existing infrastructure as how do we get more stuff built and the way you do that is you actually do a, a finer grained higher quality product you actually make these environments better for people to be in and when they're better for people to be in uh, you get more people that want to be there and you get a higher return on on your investment planners sometimes call this infill I'm not a big plan. I'm not. I'm, I'm not a. I, I never use that word. I, I don't really like it. I think when we turn infill over to planners, what we get are big projects in the center of neighborhoods. Instead of thinking about it like that, what we really need to think about is how do we do small incremental things to get the neighborhood moving in the right direction. So it, here outside my office. Uh, it's Brainerd History Week this week, and I'm giving a, a talk tonight, and we're doing a neighborhood tour of the neighborhood right outside my office here. And it's fascinating because the neighborhood is full of nice. these, yeah, it's full of these desire paths. Now, a desire path is a place where people walk today, uh, where there's no sidewalk, there's no trail, there's nothing. It's just like this is where people walk. There's a there's kind of an, a famous story. It might be apocryphal, but I I. I it's a delightful story, so I'll tell it anyway. Um, Walt Disney used to have an, he had an apartment at Disneyland, and he would come out in the morning in his bathrobe and walk around while they were getting the park ready and kind of just, you know, check things out. And one day, uh, his, um, his staff was out, and they were putting up a fence. And he said, you know, why are you guys putting up a, a fence here? And he said, well, peop they said, well, people are keep cutting across the grass, and we want to keep them on the sidewalk. And he said, no, 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 you got this wrong. Uh, rip out the sidewalk and, uh, you know, put a new sidewalk where people are actually walking. When, right. When as cities we go out and we actually observe how people are using our communities, uh, what we find is that there are a ton of unmet needs, uh, whether it's desire paths, uh, whether it is bike lanes, uh, you know, th they're small, they're micro, and they don't cost a lot to fix. And when we go out and we start trying to address those in a small way, uh, we can make significant improvements in a short period of time. And we see cities across the country doing this approach to quite successfully. So how do you suggest, so a lot of times, the uh, things like those small things, like small transit improvements, livable communities, walkable communities, addressing street trees and lighting and those kinds of things to make the placemaking work better. A lot of times in the political side of things, that just gets killed by a lot of folks as being just a uh, like a progressive, liberal, wet dream kind of thing that uh, folks don't can't really get done a lot of times in communities. Have you seen anybody being successful or do you have uh, – ways that people are, are barreling through that? Is it just explaining the math of things and getting to that point, or where, where is that at? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you framed it like that, too, because I, I am, a, I, you know, just for full disclosure, I've said twice now I don't want to get political, and I, I don't. We're a non-political organization, but I tend to be a fairly conservative guy. I've, I've really only voted uh, Democrat once in my life, and I'm a 44-year-old guy, so that tells you I've, I've done a few elections. Um, 
I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't come at this from like a tree hugger, let's, you know, get, make the world a happy place kind of standpoint. This is really dollars and cents. I'll tell you where I see cities struggle, and then I'll give you a couple examples of, of cities doing this well. Um, the, 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 where cities struggle is when they try to do this the same way they, they deliver capital projects now. The way we deliver capital projects now is we give it to our public works department, maybe we you know, give it to our, our, our city engineer, our planning department, maybe we bring in some consultants, and we make a big huge project out of it, and then we go and try to sell it through a public hearing process to people, and then we get all frustrated because the same crabby people show up, that show up to everything, but they point out, you know, look at all these hippies trying to shove trees down our throats, like, you know, get back to fixing the roads. Um, that's the that's the wrong way to go about it, and it it kind of guarantees failure because it's not the 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 people that would actually support you are not going to be present in that forum supporting you. So the way you do this successfully is you actually go out and observe first of all observe where people are struggling in your community instead of sitting behind the desk uh, and coming up with a, a capital project instead of holding a public hearing or a visioning session where those same 12 crabby people show up and tell you what to do, um, go out in your city and actually observe people. Where are people struggling? Where do I see people uh, having a hard time? We, we, we did this for a year here in this one neighborhood uh, on the other side of the office. And we saw all kinds of people, you know, walking through the ditches, running across the street when uh, they got the arrow, you know, we start asking people like, what, what are you doing? Well, it doesn't feel safe over here. I've got to get over here. This, this, is, this is not, you know, uh, comfortable for me to be in. And so we started goofing around and saying, well, what could we do? Um, we went out and we painted some rogue crosswalks. Um, we put in some bike lanes and, and, and did this traffic study and showed that if we narrowed up lanes a little bit, we could slow down some cars and, and this one stretch that they were people were having a hard time in. So what did you, you have do all the is proper you proper approvals and permits for this? No, job? no, 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 we didn't. <laughs> no. But the thing is when governments do, when governments can can do this, can take part in this, what they can do is go out and actually uh, observe where people struggle and then just do small things. You don't have to make huge projects out of this. You just go out and like take care of business. Just, just do small things and, um, and, and then watch what happens. I mean, do people respond to this? Is this a good thing? So you're, you're doing your interventions at a very small, a very micro level and you're also getting your feedback at the very micro level. You're never going to have a ribbon cutting. You're never going to have something on the front page of the paper that everybody can rally around either for or against. You're not going to have the master bike plan that you can go get a $5 million bond for and go out and implement. What you're doing is you're, you're, you're trying to triage and fill in all these gaps that you've created by taking your city and spreading it out like this. So a couple examples of places that have done this well. Um, I'm in love with Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, Memphis, Tennessee is a southern version of Detroit. Um, they're broke. Uh, they actually have uh, two-thirds the population of Detroit and double the land area. So if Detroit's problem is we've got too much stuff and not enough wealth, uh, Memphis has double the amount of stuff and two-thirds of the people. So very desperate place. But Memphis has figured out in the last decade that their best projects are these small little projects. They, they've had some big boondoggles to kind of contrast with, um, but they've had some amazing successes by just going out and fixing up little things and watching amazing stuff pop up uh, behind it. Um, you can go to the Northeast, like I said, where there's uh, cities that um, have good bones. And what you see, and I, I've seen this in cities in, in Maine, uh, Portland, Maine is a, is a great example of this. Uh, Troy, New York uh, is a great example of this, uh, where people have kind of, uh, with you know, government backing and, and government support, uh, but not necessarily with government funding, have gone out and made small little improvements to make their streets more livable and have seen a, a tremendous return on those investments. I think from a more uh, government proactive standpoint, uh, you see cities like Austin and Seattle where they've actually created, uh, in, and this is a little bit bureaucratic, but I think it works in those situations. They've created essentially like government templates for doing uh, 
micro stuff. So if you want to put a parklet in in Seattle, uh, you go down to City Hall and you get a permit, and they'll give you like 10 templates. You follow one of these, you're good to go. So if you want to go out and turn the parking lot in front of your business into a, a, you know, seating for your restaurant and increase your, your seating capacity by 20%, uh, here's how you do that. And um, you, know, you don't have to go to hearings and meetings and get approvals. So they've tried to make those micro things as easy as possible to do, and people are taking them up on it. I, I think there's exciting nice. examples all over the all over the spectrum, and for the people listening, I think it's important to um, to learn from those, but also adapt it to your local culture. Um, they couldn't do in Seattle what they do in Memphis because it's a different place. They have a different attitude mm -hmm. and a different approach. But likewise, they couldn't do in Memphis what they do in uh, in Seattle. You're not going to go to City Hall and get a permit for a parklet. You're just going to go out and you do stuff. So I, I think you have to be aware of that that culture. One thing before we go here, Chuck, that I want to share, um, it's been a recent post on strongtiles.org that I loved. It uh, was visualizing something that I thought is extremely important for folks. Let's see if this gets up here. So uh, this article is a town well-planned parcels and master street plans. Um, do you want to, could you walk people through this for me as to uh, to what this means and why it's important and how it can be used? See, that was written by Alex Dukes, and I think it was published last week. And you know, want to know something? Can I confess something? Um, oh, we, publish, we publish so much content that I have not read it all. So I'm like vaguely, I'm vaguely aware of this one, but I'm not completely. He's he's talking about taking a mall site that's a yep. run, an abandoned mall or a, a, a dilapidated mall, mm -hmm. and actually retrofitting it, um, it to to basically restore the grid and uh, and create a more fine grained approach. I, right. I haven't read the details, but I know that much about it. So yeah, it was. I loved it. It was something that if this had been published cuz one of my big issues as mayor was taking the the concepts and the things that i understood and the things that i wanted to do and and places to get done but then getting that message and that action out to people was one of the most difficult things to do because a lot of this stuff was so very antithetical to the way that we did work and the way we functioned that getting from me to uh, share that message with a city council and then share that message with the city administrator and then down the line until the people who actually need to do the work because I'm a part-time mayor to get that done, these things are extremely helpful to me. So I'll put this, we'll have, uh, I'll put show notes on the page for this at communityjobsandprogress.com and uh, so you'll be able to find all the information for it but uh, this is this is the footprint of the mall and just different transit connections and, and road connections. But then it broke it out into a variety of parcel types and subdivisions and mashed them all together into uh, this yeah. type of design for how a community can, have, community can have a variety of things in one place without having a cookie cutter design of single family homes here, smaller single family homes here, town homes here, because um, that zoning, I think, doesn't work. And uh, so it, this was one of the best examples of uh, visually showing how things can get done without having a massive development of, you know, 500 homes to make it affordable to get done. These are small developer type things, and it was can make more money, and it was great. Right. I, I, I did – Alex Dukes is a really bright guy. L let, me, let, me give you the, let me give you two sides of this. Because I, I think that okay, this, is, this, this is an interesting converse, – th that particular uh, post and those things are, are an interesting conversation because on the one hand, our country is, is littered and the, the rate is accelerating uh, with these very large sites that uh, are, are not viable anymore. Um, you know, I, I, when I was in Memphis, you could stand on top of the Walmart 
and see the last two Walmarts that had been built that were abandoned. So the original Walmart was way out in the distance. That was abandoned. Then the next Walmart, you could see it was a, it was a few blocks away. That was abandoned. And then we were on right. the existing Walmart. So we, we have these sites all over the place. And the question becomes, you know, what do you do with them? And I think the natural reaction is to say, well, let's get, a, let's get something equivalent to Walmart in here, and maybe it's a Dollar General or maybe it's a Salvation Army or what have you. Um, but th that, that doesn't really fix the underlying economic problem, which is, you know, when I look at that site as an engineer, I see millions of dollars of infrastructure with not much tax base there, not much wealth being produced. So For this, you see that? No, 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 for the original one. For the, oh, the, the original, where you've got, even with the mall in the middle, all that parking, I mean, it, it's just really, really expensive from a public standpoint. Yeah, when you go up to the original one, uh, you've got right. miles of, of infrastructure there, curb and sidewalk and all this stuff. And, and yeah, you've got the mall, but the, the tax base on that is a tiny, tiny fraction of what that uh, you know, infrastructure would need to actually make that pay off. Um, I know that's that's hard for us to grasp sometimes, uh, but this this type of site in particular is really really cash flow negative for a city. So exactly. we 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 look at this site, you know, the new one, and what you see is a a solution to that problem that's actually quite elegant. You can build this incrementally. Uh, you you don't have to you know go in and I mean you got to go in and take down the building somewhat, although you can phase that in too. A lot of this can be phased in over time, so that stuff in the top out on the edge could be built first, and then you kind of work your way down. Um, like you said, it's flexible. There's a lot of different housing styles and types. You can mix commercial in with all this, and so uh, really, from a design standpoint, this is a this is a really great, powerful way to develop or redevelop a piece of property. Now, step back here for a second, and this is in Auburn Hills. Auburn is not a city that's growing robustly. So you've just taken the one little spot. Uh, you've taken one of many, many, you know, uh, kind of failing places, and you mm -hmm. fixed it with a plan that's going to take 20 years to implement and need, like, thousands of people to live there. What do you do with the other one? And what do you do with the other one? And what do you do with the other one? And what do you do with the other one? So right. we, we have a... I think we have a, a brilliant kind of design approach um, that's not scalable. And that's where I kind of struggle with it because um, hmm. if, you, if you go a few blocks over in, in from that mall site, what you find are some really good neighborhoods that, that are already kind of set up in this way that could scale very easily. And so I, I, I struggle because while I think it's a brilliant design and I think the images are, are great and I think it's a really healthy way to think about the future of those sites, um, right. there, is so, there are so many of them and there is so much space that uh, my fear is we get uh, kind of seduced by the, the cleverness of it and right. neglect, to, n neglect to do the hard work of like incrementally going out and building it. So, Very true. Re really good, really good stuff, but I think it comes with that caveat that you're not going to be able to do this in every one of your big box stores because you just you there's never going to be enough people to fill all that. For sure, yeah. Um, all right, Chuck, we are running out of time here, or we've run out of time here, so I just want to real quick say uh, this is strongtowns.org that we're looking at now. This is uh, Chuck and a whole bunch of other folks uh, contribute constantly to uh, Strong Towns. Chuck also has a podcast that uh, people can listen to and be part of, and so that is a uh, really good thing. So, hey, there's our next event right there. How about that? There it and, is. We uh, had you on there. Absolutely. Nice. So uh, Chuck and Strong Towns is also has a book as well, so thoughts on building a strong town. Um, got it right here it as yeah. well. If uh, you want to get volume one and volume two are available in their uh, compilations of what Strong Towns has, has produced, and it's really, really good stuff. Thank you so much. Hey, it's uh, so, it's great to be here. I think people should know that you and I uh, first got uh, aware of each other because you as mayor did some things, and I, I was, I was kind of critical of you, and then you reached out and said, hey, uh, let's chat. And, and I, I want people to know that, you know, you're a guy who... Uh, has opened yourselves up to to new ideas and new thoughts, 
and uh, I, I really have always appreciated your leadership and your willingness to to talk and teach me stuff as well. So thank you for this Thanks. opportunity. It was really great. I appreciate that. I thank you very much for being here, Chuck. It uh, is great to have you, and I'm sure that we'll talk again soon. I hope so. Thanks, Brad. All right. Thanks, Chuck. Take care. You too. <laughs> uh, I don't know how to shut you off from here. There we go. All right. Uh, that was great having Chuck here. I want to real quick, I will go through and just let everybody know what the uh, um, Elected Official Institute is doing. And so this is a six-month course on, uh, on leadership, communication, and politics. And so right now we're in the first free month of that course. So we have four trainings that we're giving away at, uh, at no cost, and it's really high-value stuff like that that Chuck just gave us today. And so it's a six-month course on leadership, politics, and communication skills for motivated local elected officials. And so what we'll be doing is talking about politics, building consensus, different topics are personal communication, stress management, six-month online course with week. Well, you can check that one out again for free. Mastermind like here today where we have discussion and talk back and forth about issues that are going on in our communities on statements. And then elected officials. So next Tuesday we have a uh, um, discussion with the mayor of uh, Provo, Utah. So Mayor John Curtis will be with us on Tuesday to talk about the extraordinary things that are going on in their community and how that has uh, happened over there. And so then the fourth one each month will be a question and answer session where we can talk about whatever you want. So we've got great people involved like Dr. Norman Cotterill of the Beck Institute will be with us uh, to talk about psychology and how you can identify if you're having anxiety issues or stress management so that things don't go into a bad place because Politics is really difficult right now, and it, uh, I think it's important for everyone to understand that you're in this together and build that community. Mayor Don Ness is going to be with us to talk about consensus building. Jack Oldrich will be with us to talk about futurism and uh, change management and how you can predict what's going to happen in your communities. Chuck was today, so we're happy to have Chuck with us. Stacey Mitchell from the Institute of Local Self-Reliance will be talking about big box stores and how that affects everyone's property taxes. Um, then on the elected official front, we have Vice Mayor Allison Quas lentz will be with us. Like I said, Mayor John Curtis will be next week. And then we also have book studies with Rashini Rajkumar. She will be talking uh, with us about communication and with her book Communicate That. And then Dan Heath will be our final guest of the uh, the season in November. And Dan will talk uh, with us. He co-authored a book called Switch and Made to Stick and it's all about how you can take uh, and change things that are hard to change. And so it's government in a nutshell for you. So this is all um, Again, over the course of six months, so it goes now through November, weekly webcast, experts, and very high-level topics, so I'm excited about that. So right now, you're getting your first month free, so I'm excited to have you here with the first month. Um, it's tremendous value for you. If you were doing this as a three-day conference, that conference would be 4500 bucks plus uh, room and board, plus any uh, the course we're also offering a bunch of different gifts and books as a part of it, and my consulting time as well. So all together, that would be over $6,000 of value that we're giving you today. I originally wanted to price the course at $3,900 each. Um, I was really excited about that price, but that was a failure. Nobody wanted to pay $3,900, or no one could pay $3,900 knowing that it was either a personal cost or an expense to the city. So we nixed that one, and we pulled this six-month weekly course down to $995. So right now you can purchase the course for $995 through June 20th at midnight. So 11 p.m., 59 p.m., June 20th is when we are selling and then the price goes up after that. So $995 uh, right now for the early bird special. So if you want to uh, get in on this now, I would really love for you to join our uh, trainings and be part of this because there's a lot of great people who are coming together. Uh, you get books, you get gifts, 
things like that that come along with this course. And so we've got these weekly webcasts. Uh, we'll have, in the end, it'll be over 25 of them because we have some surprises built in along the way. And so I hope that you'll join for $9.95. It is a great value for you as an elected official. So you can learn more at the electedofficialinstitute.com is where you can find the information at the electedofficialinstitute.com. And so if you have any questions or comments or need anything, I am more than happy to uh, help you out and would like to share about the course. So thank you so much again for being here. I'll talk to you soon.